Expanding minds and hearts to reach for the reality of heaven. This is Fathom Ministries Podcast. the ministries because I am highly motivated to study and understand Bible prophecy, probably above all other issues in the Bible, because I believe that we are living in the final of the last days. The scripture teaches us when we read it, for for those that are uh, skeptical about hearing declarations of that kind, you need to understand a couple of things. One is that Scripture itself says we're in the last days, and it was saying so 2,000 years ago. And so we have to understand what that means. And Scripture, a New Testament Scripture also says, along with that, the Apostle John said, brothers and sisters, this is the last hour So, really important thing that I've come to understand is this. When they said that, God meant them to say it. He inspired scripture. Otherwise, we might as well uh, just throw the Bible away if we're not going to accept the fact that this is an inspired uh, message from God and that those who said and wrote those things, uh, meant them for their time, and God meant them to say it, and therefore he meant them, this is the key here, he meant them to believe that that was the case. And in a lot of ways, it was the case because they were facing Uh, a great persecution, and many of them, uh, the Lord came for them in the sense that they gave their life as a martyr for the gospel message. And so it's really important for us to understand that God wants us, obviously, to believe that we are living in the last days and it is the last hour because it's so stated 2,000 years ago and he meant them to believe that then. Now, does that make it impossible to know that we really are in the final minutes of the final hour? I don't think that it is, uh, it is truly uh, a problem being able to understand that we are living in the final minutes of the final hour. I I think that when we study Bible prophecy and we see how many things have come together as a result of uh, the fulfillment of Scripture in our time, and then we match that up to what Jesus said about the when. When will these things be? If you read Matthew 24, the disciples asked Jesus, when will these things be? And Jesus answered it, not by giving a date. Uh, And of course, I would recommend you don't listen to anyone who sets dates because there uh, there is nothing worse for the subject of Bible prophecy than listening to people that are so deluded that they think they can set dates because uh, Jesus made it very clear that the date could not be set. So, um, all we can know is the final hour, and if the last 2,000 years was the final hour, there's going to be a time when it's the final five minutes, it's the final 60 seconds. I don't, I don't mean really 60 seconds, but I mean uh, things are going to concentrate into a very short period of time. And it is Jesus who taught us in Matthew 24 that there would be some things coming together at the end of time 
when you see these things coming together, all of the things that are mentioned in Bible prophecy are going to be fulfilled. All of the things that Jesus uh, said would come to pass are all going to come to pass at the same time. So what he is saying and what we need to understand about Bible prophecy is that the Lord has made it clear that when you see a crescendo of things coming, that you will know the time is near because it will be similar to when a lady who is pregnant is about to give birth to a baby and it she starts having labor pains, not false labor pains, but real labor pains. And so the final five minutes, uh, so to speak, of the final hour is going to be observable and critically, legitimately identifiable if we are up to date on what is in the scripture concerning Bible prophecy. Now, in the last lesson, and I hope if you haven't heard it, you can go back and find it on my podcast a few months ago. Lesson one of Bible prophecy on the literal versus allegorical method of interpretation. It's really important to understand this because the battle that we are having today, that, that we are fighting out in terms of biblical interpretation and a defense of the truth, which I believe is, is so critically important. It certainly is to me. That's why I study the Bible, uh, because I want to know what it teaches and just how accurate the details are. I want to pay attention to the details. And so in the first lesson, which by the way, these lessons are based upon a book called Things to Come by Dwight Pentecost, which I highly recommend if you really are interested in getting into the details of scripture and theology uh, on, a, on a level where you can understand it. The lesson one being about the literal interpretation of scripture versus an invented method of interpretation that was brought about by my many factors that we cover in that lesson. I don't want to retrace my steps there, but there is a problem with the allegorical method of interpretation. And what you'll find is when you're listening to people teach the Bible is that a lot of times they will mix up these two things. They will take you to scripture and they will not pay attention to the literal interpretation of that scripture. And they will turn it into an allegorical uh, interpretation and then substantiate what it is that they're teaching or they believe. This is really a very problematic uh, situation that arises because you cannot know the truth unless you agree upon the principles of interpretation. And you got to understand why the allegorical method, uh, one of the reasons why the allegorical method was so appealing. And I want to explain this because it's so important. Well, first, what is the allegorical method? Uh, once again, listen to my podcast so you can get a full detail of what it is. But the allegorical method is simply taking scripture, not as its literal sense, but to take it in a figurative sense. In other words, taking a scripture setting and instead of taking it literally as it would be normally read, to make it into a spiritualized version that the person speaking to you will say, well, this means, and then they turn it into a spiritual meaning rather than to look at it for what it says. If the Bible means a spiritual meaning, like Jesus did in tell, teaching on the things that he covered through parables, he will explain himself and no one will have to guess whether or not he meant it as a figurative or a typical speech. So it's really important to understand that these methods of interpretation have to be thought through and you've got to look and see what God intended when he gave us his book. And it is quite clear he did not intend for it to be used in an allegorical uh, interpretive sense. And I'll tell you, though, the reason that it was embraced by the church in the beginning, and unfortunately, a majority of Christian churches in uh, the world today have made this their standard fare for interpreting Scripture. And I think it's insidious because Satan has got in 
to the middle between what God says and what people interpret from it. And he has been able to uh, twist and turn it in a wicked sort of sense, just like he did in the Garden of Eden when he talked to Eve about what God had said about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He always wants to reinterpret and twist and change the meaning of what God has spoken. And this becomes a real problem because if you don't know the truth, you won't be made free and you won't be saved. So you've got to seek the Holy Spirit so that you can understand and appreciate the truth. So this allegorical method, though, was very appealing because there were so many prophetic scriptures about the nation of Israel in the entirety of the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And for the whole history of the church, it looked like these things were impossible. Now, this is a point that I think is really important uh, in my own understanding of why there is such a tendency to receive the allegorical interpretation of Scripture. You see, whenever you read the Bible today, and, you, and it says God's going to restore Israel, he's going to put them back in their land, he's going to bless the land, the land's going to be flowing with milk and honey again, we don't even blink because there is an Israel, it is like the eighth most rich and prosperous nation in the world today. And all of this has happened in the last 70 years. But most of us are not 70 years old. And so in our entire lifetime, when we read Old Testament scriptures about Israel, we know that those things can happen because there is such a place as Israel. However, in the history of the church for 2,000 years, since about 70 AD, and then again in about 123, I think, AD, Israel was completely wiped out. Jerusalem was completely destroyed, and it was completely ransacked and turned into a non-Israel uh, country. And for the last 2,000 years, there, there was no Israel until the 20th century, until 1948. And so we have a bunch of theologians who read the scriptures concerning God's reviving of Israel. In other words, uh, if you want an example, go to Ezekiel chapter 37 and 38. Uh, or maybe it's 36, 37, and 38. In there, he asked Ezekiel, can these bones be resurrected? Can they live again? And he shows how he is going to revive the nation of Israel from its dead state. And when you read that, don't think of, of this valley of dry bones as meaning that Israel was dead in the grave. It wasn't dead in the grave. The people of Israel, the Jews, were alive. But as a nation, they were scattered all throughout all the nations, and they had no hope in their mind or in history of ever being a nation again. No nation of people that has ever lost their land and been scattered to other countries has ever came back and reestablished themselves as the people of that land. That has never happened. The nations of the history of man who have vanished from their land are vanished forever, except one. And the one that that exception applies to is the nation of Israel. But you have to put yourself back in time to understand what's going on. Read the scriptures in Ezekiel, and think about reading it in 300 AD, when there has been no nation of Israel in the history of your lifetime. And then 400, 500, 900, 1500, uh, 1492, we know the, the saying, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And he came and discovered the Americas, right? When he did, there was no Israel. And so what people did and what they were tempted to do is to disbelieve Scripture 
that God was going to actually bring back Israel. It looked like a complete impossibility. And so because they did believe in Scripture, and they do believe in God, and they do believe that what God says is true, what they did was they did what Abraham did. Abraham was told, you're going to have a son with Sarah. Well, two problems, or three problems. One was their age, uh, especially for uh, the woman's case, Sarah, because she was already past the time of being able to have children. Not only was she past the time of being able to have children, uh, a woman gets in a, to a place in her life where she cannot have children ever again. Well, this was a double whammy because Sarah never had children to begin with. Her womb did not produce children ever. And so when she was 90 years old, God is promising her that she's going to have Isaac, that she's going to have a son. And so what happens is, is Abraham and Sarah decides, maybe we can do it this way. Let's let you have a child through the slave woman that is my slave. Now, uh, I don't want to get on a rabbit trail to explain how come that was a, a, an available avenue to have children. Uh, but nevertheless, it wasn't God's intention that people used uh, multiple wives in this sense. But in those days, that is what was the reality of what they did. So men did have multiple wives, in spite of the fact this was never God's plan and is still not God's plan. Suffice it to say that uh, Abraham had a son for Sarah through Sarah's slave woman, and his name was Ishmael. And so when God came along many years after Ishmael was born, and he goes, Abraham, you're still going to have your son. It seemed like that God could not or was not going to produce the son in the normal way because it was way past time to do that. So they figured they had figured a way to help God out and have this son Ishmael. So Abraham's reply to God was, oh, let Ishmael be that son. And God said, no, 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 Ishmael was a big mistake. He is not going to be the son. Ishmael is not going to be the promised son. He is not the one. The one that I'm bringing to you is still to come, and it's going to come through your wife, Sarah. And that's, of course, in the story. You can go back and find out that Sarah laughed and got in trouble with God for laughing at him saying this. Well, why? On a natural basis, it was completely impossible. There was no possibility that a woman 90 year, years old who had already went through menopause and who had never had a child before and was married to a man 100 years old was going to have a son all of a sudden. Well, if you read the Bible, you will find out that they did indeed have a son. His name was Isaac, and God did give it to them through Sarah. Woo! That's great. That's exciting. Well, what the early church forgot to do was to pay attention to these kind of scriptures because they would read that God is going to revive Israel and they decided they needed to find a way to interpret that scripture so that it would make sense and yet it would not uh, involve Israel because there was no Israel. There were no Jews around in a nation called Israel in order for these promises of God to come to pass. So they decided that we've got to find a way to interpret scripture in such a way that it will still be true, but it will uh, not involve the nation of Israel because there is no Israel. Just like Abraham was thinking, there is no son coming through Sarah. There is no Israel. There's never going to be an Israel. It's impossible. They've long been gone, hundreds of years. No Israel. If God was going to do Israel, I could just hear the preachers uh, saying, oh, come on, if God was going to revive and restore Israel, it already happened. But he hasn't done it, so it's never going to happen. Well, what did they do? They came up with an allegorical interpretation. Let's just take the whole Old Testament, and when it talks to Israel, 
let's realize what God is talking about is his church or his people. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean anything having to do with the bloodline of Abraham or the having Jewish blood in your veins. It can mean anybody who is a member of God's church or group or people. And so let's go back and revise the history of what is being spoken in the scripture and see each and every one of these things as applying to God's current church. Obviously, God's people are not Jews now, although there are Jews in the church, but he hasn't he has not made uh, any distinction between Jews and Gentiles in the church. And so the thought was that we could go on and we could uh, reconfigure what Scripture is saying, and then we would be able to come to the conclusion that Scripture indeed is beautiful, it makes sense, and it's applicable to the church, but it is not applicable to Israel. And this is where we get the replacement theology where the church replaces Israel in Scripture for the past and into the future. The past at the point where Israel is rejected by God and that he has, they have broken covenant with him and therefore he has taken that breaking of that covenant as a final nail in their coffin and he has turned away from them and turned to the Gentiles. And so some of them, of course, kind of blend their theology into there's not going to be another Israel at all ever in the future. And then there's others that do see Israel later coming back way in the future. They still see the churches replacing Israel in the here and the now. And so without getting into the details of the theology of replacement theology, I just want to tell you that it is an heretical doctrine it is one that confuses Scripture. It is entirely based not on a literal interpretation of Scripture, but it is based on allegorical interpretation, spiritualizing the things that have happened in the past that are literal, and taking the meaning out of them and applying them to the church spiritually. The folks that believe this, they believe all the promises of God in the Bible are to them. And they'll say it. They'll say, all the promises of Scripture are mine, and I claim all of them. Well, uh, this is a farce, and it is absolutely not true. God did not promise to take you out of Egypt because you're not in Egypt, but he did promise Israel to deliver them from Egypt. Uh, God did not promise to part the Red Sea for you, not literally and not spiritually but he did promise it to them. When you are reading the promises of Scripture, sometimes you're reading promises that are specifically to one person. Or in the case of Jesus, in some cases, he promised things to his 12 disciples. And I've heard many uh, theologians, speakers, preachers, pastors, teachers, just take anything that is said out of context, not paying attention, who is being spoken to? What is being spoken? Is there really a reason to believe that what Jesus said at that place and at that time meant to every person who ever hears these words? And so many times, there are so many false doctrines uh, produced and built upon these uh, so-called promises that are made to a specific person for a specific time at a specific place, uh, and, and, and just, you know, wholesale adding that to themselves that it leads to a mass confusion. And that's why scripture becomes so crazy. Uh, it's like taking your Bible and treating it like a Ouija board where you open it up, you lay your finger on some scripture, you read it, you don't pay any attention to context, you just read the line that your finger lands on, and then you run your day by it. You think there's something wrong with that? If you don't think there's something wrong with that, you have no idea how the devil is going to twist God's word to make you think that you are being led by God in some supernatural, mystical way 
when what you're doing is practicing witchcraft with the Bible. This is not how God ever intended his scripture to be handled. And this is why the Bible teaches us to watch out for novices and watch out for people that don't know anything that they're talking about. And yet they are following fables and ridiculous beliefs that are not true. So I encourage you to pay attention to the previous lesson on the literal versus allegorical interpretation and realize that there is no precedent for an allegorical or a spiritualized interpretation of Scripture. People who allegorically interpret Scripture cannot be held to any kind of standard, and so it leaves scriptural interpretation to the fantasies of human mind and the creativity of the artist who takes a literal story and turns it into a spiritual lesson. And it changes the meaning of words and the intent of the author, which is the Holy Spirit. And so if uh, I were to write a book and then somebody took that book and said, you know what, I don't like what it says literally, so we'll just turn it into a spiritual, uh, parabolic, figurative story that we can make mean what we want it to mean. This would be the greatest achievement of Satan if he could do this, and he has done it. So if you want to come to the correct interpretation of biblical prophecy, you're going to have to go see how the Bible has been interpreted in history by those in the Bible times, not the church not the fathers of the church, meaning those after the apostles, not the Catholic Church of history, not even the Reformation or the uh, Protestant Church of history. All of those things matter, and it's good to read them and, and learn what people thought. It's all good to pay attention to history. There's no, there, I, I greatly encourage it. I was not raised with a lot of emphasis on church history because I was raised in an organization that thought they were the people with the truth and no one prior to them really had it except the apostles. And uh, that, that was a ludicrous uh, uh, presupposition to begin with. But nevertheless, that's why they didn't emphasize church history because they couldn't see anybody in church history until uh, the advent of the 20th century being saved uh, because they didn't hold to that doctrine to the degree that they held their doctrine. So um, church history was minimized, and that, that was a great deficit in my understanding when I was younger. But now that I've looked back and paid attention and appreciated church history, uh, I see a lot of things that the historical church has gotten wrong, but you can't ignore all the things that they also got right. And you realize generation to generation, nobody understands everything perfectly. And so we must assume we don't either. And therefore, we're going to be saved by the grace of God, even though all of our theology isn't perfect. Um, he is going to help us to make sure we get the right things or the important things right so that we can be saved in the end. And then... When we all get to heaven, we're all going to find out exactly how close to the truth we were and where we were wrong. So it's really important to understand the history of biblical interpretation if we're going to fully appreciate the details of Scripture and be able to take a look at prophecy in a particular and make sure that we're uh, understanding it the way that God meant it to be understood. So to sum up my introduction here, I just want to say, once again, one of the main motivations for believing in a spiritualized allegorical interpretation method was because they read stories about Israel being revived and restored, and they could not imagine that that was possible, just like Abraham could not imagine that he could have a baby at 100 years old with a 90-year-old wife who has already went through her menopause. He couldn't understand that that could possibly be done until God emphasized it to him the second time 
whenever he rejected Ishmael and said, no, there is going to be a son through Sarah, your wife. The great thing about Abraham, I hope is true of you. And that is, is that when you study and listen to the logic and reason that I'm outlining here and that others are outlining in terms of Bible prophecy, that you too will be able to say, you know what, maybe I didn't see it before, but I see what you're saying now and I'm going to pay attention to it. Now, for part two here, or getting into the meat of this message, let's jump right into where we are going to take our instruction from, and that is going to be looking at the Bible itself and seeing exactly how important the interpretation of Scripture is. If you could just read Scripture uh, and give everybody a Bible and say, read it, and then you've got it, and that's it, that would be wonderful. But a lot of people come to different conclusions because they are understanding how to interpret it wrong. You go back to the Old Testament time of Ezra, after 70 years that Israel had been exiled, that means to be removed from their land, Ezra begins to mark a new beginning of biblical interpretation. Now, you need to understand the history. The history is Israel sinned. Israel drifted away from God. They weren't paying attention to the details of what the prophets were saying. And the prophets at that time had Bible prophecy about Israel's exile. And they were saying, Israel's going to be taken out because they're not serving God. They're not paying attention to God. They're not paying attention to Scripture. And they absolutely scoffed and didn't believe them because God did not move quickly. He gave them time to repent, and they did not repent. So, after they were taken out of the land, they were taken out like uh, sheep led to the slaughter, and they were just empowered to become slaves and taken to meaningless lives into the various lands around them, especially into Babylon area. And so they were taken to the, this land and they were told ahead of time by prophets, Jeremiah specifically said, you're going to be there 70 years. Now this is very interesting because it's a really a generation, which means that God is punishing everyone in that generation who had rejected his prophets who had not listened to him, and he made sure that they were there 70 years because that way all of them die off. The complete group that came out would die off in that period of time. Well, this happened, and then we get to the uh, prophet Daniel, and the prophet Daniel, he goes and reads Jeremiah and what Jeremiah has said, and that there would be 70 years, and he's getting down to 68, 69 years, and he's saying, you know what? I expect that God is going to do what he said. Not spiritually, not allegorically. He wasn't going to revive Israel in a spiritual sense. He wasn't going to revive Israel through Gentiles uh, and replace Israel with somebody else. No, he read in Jeremiah that they were going to be in the land for 70 years. He lived out that time himself along with Israel. And then at the close of the 70 years, at the 68th, 69th year, he began to fervently pray because he seen the time was the final hour. And so God made it to where they could perceive that it was going to be the final hour and that it was time to start looking for redemption, looking for restoration, looking for getting to go back to their country, to their land and rebuild it. So this was exactly what happened. God was able to work through the prophet Daniel and the prophet Jeremiah, and he was able to work through Ezra and Nehemiah, and he was able to do all these things that he had promised. And so what we learn from this is that God literally uh, brought about what he said was going to happen, he literally made it happen uh, for Israel exactly like uh, he had spoken through the prophets. And so after 70 years of exile, what kind of method 
of Bible prophecy worked? Was it an allegorical method that worked for Daniel and Jeremiah? It was not. It was the absolute literal method of interpretation that Daniel understood Scripture to be, and it was the literal method of interpretation that proved in time, in Scripture, and in history to be the method that God meant it to be. Now, with that understanding in our pocket, what in the world are we supposed to come away from this and think? Are we supposed to think that, in this case, the literal method worked, but now we should take a spiritualized, allegorical way of looking at it? That would make no sense whatsoever, would it? So, of course not. The literal method is going to be the way that God uses his scripture now and then and in the future. That's the way it's going to work. So here come the Jews. They're going to be restored to their land. They're going to go back and rebuild it. And guess what they did? They had their first Old Testament Bible interpretation setting. I'm going to read to you out of Nehemiah 8.8. 8. And at the beginning here, I do want to explain to you that in uh, podcasts, a lot of times I use the New Living Translation, and I like it. It's one of my favorite uh, translations because it doesn't require a lot of explanation. They've, they've really pegged the modern vernacular of English and, and, and done a good job. However, true Bible students need a literal interpretation of Scripture uh, that, that is not just a translation, but something that has been really devoted to the literal word-for-word -word translation so that, you know, each word is, has its equivalent in the language of English uh, as much as possible. And, of course, uh, my favorite version for that is the New American Standard Bible. And so the NASB is, uh, is my go-to theological anchor. It's my theological rock that I depend on uh, because I do not know uh, you know, uh, Hebrew and Greek, and of course I have the tools to look up those words and use dictionaries, but uh, that doesn't make me someone who would understand the original language. So I have to depend on the scholars who have interpreted the Bible, and I do want to make sure you understand that I know uh, the difference between the New Living Translation and uh, a Bible like the NASB or the New King James Bible, um, or the ESV. All of these are really good. Uh, the ESV um, is, is pretty similar to the NASB, So, uh, but uh, without getting into it, there are reasons to go for the NASB today. And that'll change in the future. They'll come out with better ones. Uh, and so we'll just keep looking at, see what the scholars produce and the ones that are more devoted to uh, the literal interpretation of each word of Scripture into English, those are the ones we really love. So anyway, but I do use the NLT, the New Living Translation, the second edition, a lot, and I will be doing that in this lesson. So here we have the Old Testament Jews coming back to their land Let's look now at Nehemiah 8.8 8 and see what this prophet says. He is going to talk to us about what Ezra the priest and the Levites did. And so the they in this verse are Ezra the priest and the, and the Levites. Listen to this. They read from the book of the law of God and clearly explained the meaning of what was being read helping the people understand each passage. My goodness, if you want to know what a good church looks like, it's a church that does this. Taking you through the Bible one passage at a time and explaining what that is. This is the way the church should go. It's unfortunately not the way the emergent church is going in America. And they're trying to uh, trim their uh, lessons to meet the desires of the ungodly and the new generation of non-believers and to entice them through words of wisdom to come to God and coach them into uh, 
the house of God. But unfortunately, this doesn't transform you. This only sells you on an idea. But what we need today is the same thing that all people of God have always needed, and that is to be delivered from sin and to be transformed by the power of the Word of God through the Holy Spirit. And so this is going to be really important. And so Nehemiah introduces us to the biblically defined meaning of Bible interpretation and how it should be done. This was especially needed for the Jews in those days because they no longer spoke Hebrew. They had adopted the Aramaic language and they had really drifted far from their roots uh, in that case. And so they needed someone to help them to look back at the Hebrew scriptures and to get themselves back to alignment. And believe me, they wanted to. They desired God's help through these things. Now, when you go back in time, and let's say back to 347 AD to 420 AD, there was a guy who was a Catholic priest named Jerome. And he did not like literal interpretation. He was an advocate of spiritualized and mystical methods of interpretation. He had a knack for making meaning out of what was in Scripture that was fantastical and far out and spiritual and mystical. And as a matter of fact, he was so against literal interpretation that he charged that the literal method of interpretation was the Jewish method. You gotta understand, because of the Catholic Church's adoption of this, of this idea that the church has replaced Israel, that they hated the Jews, they persecuted the Jews more than anyone did. And so Jerome thought he was making points by saying with a sneer, that literal method of interpretation is a Jewish method. The literal interpretation was a marked feature of the Old Testament interpretation. You could not get away from that. Jerome and those who were with him and who were like him considered this quote-unquote Jewish method to be far inferior to the more spiritual method of interpretation that they had invented out of whole cloth. So what we can understand by the points that we're making here and conclude is that the Jews did follow the method of interpretation known as the literal method. And the Catholic Church drifted greatly away from this method of interpretation and they went into the mystical and the spiritualized method of interpretation which brings you to the conclusion at the end that God is going to come back through Jesus Christ and he's going to rapture the church at the same time. Then he is going to uh, set up his kingdom and the church is going to go through the great tribulation, but that's okay because the church has replaced the Jews. And so the tribulation becomes about the church instead of about the Jewish nation and the Jewish people. The book of Daniel and the interpretation of the 70th week of Daniel, this is for the church and not the Jews. And all of this is accomplished because of this big, twisted method of interpretation. If you go to the book of Daniel and you look and see how much he's talking about the Jews and everything, including the uh, words uh, that he uses about God's people, about Jacob, about Israel, about Jerusalem. Uh, and then you look at Matthew 24 and Jesus, he is quoting from Daniel. He's pointing people back to Daniel and he's talking about the Jews. He's talking about Jerusalem. He's talking about uh, Israel. In all these cases, you have to spiritualize and turn that into spiritual analogies instead of believing in the literal places and timing and peoples that are being spoken of. But when we look at Old Testament, we see Jews indeed did not interpret the scripture based upon allegories and based upon spiritualization, but they believed in the literal interpretation of scripture. And the great thing is, the reason this matters is because if you embrace the literal grammatical 
historical method of interpretation, all of that means that you just read the book like you would read any other book and take it at face value and let it explain itself. And when it's literal, take it literal. When it's spiritual, take it spiritual when it says so. And when it's a type, take it as a type. Then you are able to come away with the, the correct interpretation of biblical prophecy and the rest of scriptural teaching. Let's talk about literalism in the time of Jesus. The prevailing method of interpretation at the time of Christ was still the literal method of interpretation. There was an English theologian uh, by the name of Thomas Horn. And here's something that he wrote back in the 17 to 1800s. This is a quote from Horn. The allegorical interpretation of the sacred scriptures was not common with the Jews of Palestine at the time of Christ and his apostles. Although the Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish bunch that interpreted scripture, the Sanhedrin and the hearers of Jesus often appealed to the Old Testament, yet they gave no indication of the allegorical interpretation. Even Josephus has nothing of it. The Platonic Jews of Egypt began in the first century in imitation of the heathen Greeks to interpret the Old Testament allegorically. So this is where all of it begins. This is where the twisting of the scripture happens. And unfortunately, a lot of preachers today don't even know about this. And yet they depend upon the spiritualization of scripture and they're the people that are up there telling you all the promises of God are to the church. And they're the ones telling you that every time the Bible promises something, it's to you. And all of the things that God has promised Israel is coming to the church. I've got to tell you, it is ridiculously stupid to take that position. There is nothing in Scripture itself that gives this kind of idea. God has never promised Jerusalem to the church. He has never promised to the church a land and a nation. He has never promised to the church the things that he promised to the Jews and to Abraham. And he never meant them spiritually for the church. He only meant them for the people that he gave them to. Horn goes on to say this, quote, Philo of Alexandria was distinguished among those Jews who practice this method. And he, the, the method he's talking about is the spiritualized or allegorical method. And he defends it as something new and before unheard of. For this reason, he was opposed by the other Jews. This method did not prevail at the time of Jesus among the Jews. Certainly, not in Palestine or in, in Israel, where Jesus taught. He is making the point that Jesus had never heard of this. The Jews had never heard of this. All of this was made and created at the time of Philo of Alexandria after the fact. And this was not an accepted method of interpreting scripture. Now let me introduce you to a lady named Shirley Jackson Case. She wrote a book back in 1918 called The Millennial Hope. And she is an ardent advocate of amillennialism, okay? Amillennialism, you know what that is, right? It means that there is not going to be a millennial kingdom. There isn't going to be a thousand-year reign of Christ. There isn't going to be a restoration of Israel and God restoring uh, David to the throne. None of this is going to happen according to the belief of Shirley Case. Here's a quote from her. Undoubtedly, the ancient Hebrew prophets announced the advent of a terrible day of Jehovah when the old order of things would suddenly pass away. Later prophets foretold a day of restoration for the exiles when all nature would be miraculously changed and an ideal kingdom of David established. Early Christians expected soon to behold Christ returning upon the clouds even as they had seen him in their visions literally ascending into heaven. She continues, 
Any attempt to evade these literalistic features of biblical imagery is futile. What is she saying? You can't evade them. You can't ignore them. They are really there. She continues, quote, Ever since Origins Day, certain interpreters of Scripture have sought to refute millennial expectations by affirming that even the most striking statements about Jesus' return are to be understood figuratively. It has also been said that Daniel and Revelation are highly mystical and allegorical works not intended to refer to actual events, whether past, present, or future, but have a purely spiritual significance like that of Milton's Paradise Lost or Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. These are evasive devices designed to bring these scriptures into harmony with present conditions while ignoring the vivid expectancy of the ancients. Wow. So, this is how we get to, and here's an example of what it means to take the method of allegorical interpretation and make that your method. Is that what you want to do? Is this, can you live with this statement by Shirley Case? She acknowledges there's no way to avoid the literalistic features of the biblical imagery. You can't avoid it. It's futile. And yet, now we understand through origin that we could refute these expectations by changing our understanding to understand it to be figurative. And it, it is figurative, and it was meant to be figurative, and it will always be figurative. So the books of Daniel, the book of Revelation, they're mystical, they're allegorical. They were never intended to be real events. If you read your Bible from cover to cover, you would never come to this conclusion on your own. You would have to be told something this ridiculous to believe it. And it's amazing how Satan has got this convincing argument into the church. I want to continue with Case in her quote here. The afflicted Jews of the Maccabean times were demanding, not a figurative, but a literal end of their troubles. Nor did Daniel promise them anything less than an actual establishment of a new heavenly regime. You see, Case doesn't believe this. She's saying these stupid people really thought this was going to happen. She, she continues, Premillennialists are thoroughly justified in their protest against those opponents who allegorize or spiritualize pertinent biblical passages, thus retaining scriptural phrases while utterly perverting their original significance. Premillennialist, that's me. I'm the premillennialist. What does that mean? It means I believe that Jesus Christ is coming before, pre, the millennial kingdom, a thousand years of Christ's reign, and that makes me a premillennialist. She's an amillennialist. It it's spelled with an A, a millennialist, but they pronounce it amillennialist. It means no millennium. Ah, no millennium. No thousand years. No restoration. It's really amazing. And I've seen people do this often, and it's scary. They will read scripture, and they have no compunction to turn around and say, no, I don't believe that means what it says. I've even, in, in debates with people, I've even had them say it out loud so they could hear how stupid and ridiculous they sound after reading a scripture and saying, no, that doesn't mean what it says. That's what this case person is saying. That's what heretics say. That's what people that do not know the truth, do not love the truth will say. They will say anything and believe anything because they want it to be so. They do not see themselves as subject to God's decisions, God's declarations, and they don't know that they have to lay down their own desires when they are in conflict with God, when they're conflicted with God's own judgments, determinations, predeterminations, etc. Now, it would not be proper 
to point back and say the Jews used a literal method of interpretation without acknowledging that they had strayed themselves because the truth of the matter is their literal interpretations, we're not talking about the Jews in the scripture, but we're talking about the Jews of Jesus' day, uh, they had strayed themselves and that's why they failed to recognize Jesus and they failed to understand the truth themselves of scripture. And what happened with them, Satan, if he can't get you one way, he'll get you another. And their, their literal interpretation was a decadent literalism that had warped scripture of all meaning themselves. And it was called a hyper-literalistic interpretation. This hyper-literalistic interpretation was horrible. I want to give you a quote from Bernard Rand. He's a, he's a theologian and an author called Protestant Bible Interpretation. Here's what he says. The Jewish literalistic school is literalism at its worst. It is the exaltation of the letter to the point that all true sense is lost. It grossly exaggerates the incidental and accidental and ignores and misses the essential. So the Jews certainly had their problems and their literalistic interpretations ran amok for sure. I want to give you an example of what that looks like, and it comes from Satan himself. In Matthew 4, 3 through 7, this is going to be out of the New King James Version. It says, now when the tempter came to Jesus, he said, quote, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. So we see not only the author of perverted, twisted, wicked interpretive methods, and what he used on Jesus was not a spiritualization or an allegorical interpretive method. He took it to the literal sense that we would call extra literal, ridiculously literal. So he took a scripture and he says, look, you know, command the stones, you're hungry, command the stones to become bread. Show me you have the power. Show me you are it. Show me you are the man. Make stones into bread. And Jesus goes, no, 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 no. That is a misappropriation of scripture, a misinterpretation. The Bible says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil does it again, and he says, well, let me just take you up here into the holy city, set you on a pinnacle of the temple, and, and, and let's just see you throw yourself down, and for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Hyper-literalistic interpretation does not work. The only method of Bible interpretation used and recognized by the apostles and Jesus himself was the literal method of interpretation. This is absolutely true. Even the critics know that this is true, and they think it was okay to change it after the fact, after Scripture and all of those who brought a Scripture never envisioned an allegorical method of interpretation and so you take the apostles, uh, uh, Paul himself and others, and you take all of them, put, the, put them together, the Old Testament prophets, Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, Jeremiah, Daniel, and you realize nobody ever envisioned this kind of going after scripture. And of course, that's why Bible interpretation has so suffered in our final times today. But one thing for sure, I am not one who believes in having an attitude like the sky is falling, everything's getting so bad, there's no hope. I trust in the Lord doing all of the saving and all of the protection of his truth and all of the preservation of his church until the time of the rapture of the church. 
So I am not in a panic about what I see going on, although it looks like we're losing ground uh, faster than we've ever lost ground before. Whatever ground is lost is lost because God determined that it would be so in the end. We know scripture prophesies that in the last days men would turn away from the truth. And so I'm not panicked nor concerned about it because I, for myself, am very, very uh, fired up to preserve the truth for myself and for my family and to search it out and to know it, understand it, seek it. Um, I am on fire for the truth. I am, I've never been more expectant to receive from the Lord further understanding and wisdom from his scripture. Uh, not new. I don't, I don't mean new. I, I can't stand the people who are thinking that they're going to go out and find new scripture and new theology and new things. They are the biggest danger to faith that exists because they're always twisting it so that they can make it new. We don't need the new. We need the old understood. We don't know enough about the old to spend any time trying to invent something that the apostles didn't know anything about or the previous generation didn't know anything about. We need what has been established. And only that. I can only trust that. I cannot trust people who come up with new things because those new things, uh, if they're not old, they're not trustworthy. They're not truly tried. And uh, I, I have no interest in these new fangled ideas that are being associated with Christianity. And I could give a list of plenty of them, but all you've got to do is keep your nose in the scripture and keep your antenna up, your radar on, in the sense that you are going to avoid those who lead people astray by new and fantastic doctrines that nobody knew uh, until they come up with them. Let me introduce you to a guy that was a Hebrew scholar, and he was the author of The Grammar of Prophecy. He lived back in the 1800s, died in 1923. His name was Robert Baker Girdlestone. Here's what he said, quote, We are brought to the conclusion that there was one uniform method commonly adopted by all the New Testament writers in interpreting and applying the Hebrew scriptures. It is as if they had all been to one school and had all studied under one master. The Lord Jesus Christ and no other was the original source of the method. In this sense, as in many others, he had come a light into the world. So it's really interesting. Satan really did a great job at promoting this ridiculous idea of algorithms as a way. This idea of algorithm or allegorical interpretation as a legitimate method. Of interpreting scripture. You know, Philo was a Jew, and he was living at the same time as Christ. He was older than Christ. He died, I think, in 50 AD. He was in Egypt, in Alexandria. He, his name was Philo Judaeus. Philo's aim was to commend the Jewish religion to the educated Greek world, who were non-Jewish, of course, to do so, he had to adopt an allegorizing method of interpretation. He was a Jewish biblical philosopher. If he would have been in Israel, he would have been an opponent of Jesus, and he would have been rebuked by Jesus, just like Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and the Sadducees of his time. He used allegory for the purpose of fusing and harmonizing Greek philosophy and Judaism, making it a worldly religious experience. His method followed the practices of both Jewish uh, interpretation, exegesis, and Stoic philosophy. His work was not widely accepted. Unfortunately, Philo's works were enthusiastically received by the early Christians, some of whom saw him as a cryptic Christian. His concept of the Logos as God's creative principle apparently influenced early Christology, to him, Logos was God's blueprint for the world, which was a governing plan. Now, a man named F.W. Farrar, F-A-R-R-A-R, -R -R, 
he wrote a book called History of Interpretation in 1886. And here's what he said. The fathers of the third and later centuries may be divided into three interpretive schools, exegetical schools. One, literal and realistic. That would be Tertullian. Uh, two, the allegorical division, which is origin. And three, the historical and grammatical. That's Theodore of Mopsuestia. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It's M-O-P-S-U-E-S-T-I-A. What we have is the allegorical being origin, and of course, origins greatly influenced by Philo, origin of the church, and then Philo of the Jews. These two together are the ones who cemented this idea for the church in our day, from their day to our day. And of course, Augustine became really into this, and he is the one who we can blame all this being accepted uh, for. I introduce you to another man named Clement of Alexandria. And you'll remember that uh, when we talk about Alexandria, we're talking about in Egypt, there's a city called Alexandria. Clement was a teacher at the school of Alexandria who made it fashionable to interpret scripture allegorically in an open fashion. I mean, he really set it forth. And Farrar says Clement of Alexandria believed in the divine origin of Greek philosophy. He thought, he thought there was a supernatural thing going on there, openly propounded the principle that all scripture must, emphasis on the word must, be allegorically understood. Origen, his name was Origen Adamantius. Origen is credited in developing the allegorical method as it applies to scripture. And so, you know, he takes from Philo, which is a Jewish philosopher, and he takes it into the Christian realm, and he wrote that the soul passes through successive stages of incarnation before eventually reaching God. He imagined even demons being reunited with God. For origin, God was the first principle in Christ. The Logos was subordinate to him. His views of a hierarchical structure in the Trinity, the temporality of matter, quote, the fabulous pre-existence of souls, end of quote, and quote, the monstrous restoration which follows from it, end of quote, were declared anathema in the 6th century. So here we go. We, we've got a guy that is considered like one of the fathers of algorithm in the uh, church, and yet most of the church today are taking their interpretive skills from a person who comes up with this fantastical, imaginative gobbledygook. So what happened with allegorical interpretation? Well, the church leaders seized complete control of the authority of Scripture through allegorism. It was the rise of ecclesiasticism, which was a devotion to the interests of the church and the recognition of the authority of the church in all doctrinal matters that gave great momentum to the adoption of the allegorical method. The Roman Catholic Church loves to strut their stuff and say they have all authority over the interpretation of Scripture, and you have no right to interpret scripture for yourself. If the church hasn't interpreted it, it isn't interpretive. It isn't possible. So they bring that authority into themselves and this method of interpretation suits this heretical, damnable doctrine. Augustine, according to Farrar, was one of the first to make scripture conform to the interpretation of the church, says J. Dwight Pentecost. Augustine laid down the rule that the Bible must be interpreted with reference to church orthodoxy, which means accepted and approved beliefs, or orthodoxy. It's no coincidence that the root of algorithm popularized by Augustine took hold about the time of the Dark Ages. And it took the Reformation movement to turn the tide back to a true interest in Bible interpretation and integrity 
in the literal method of interpretation, which the Reformation, of course, happened in the 14th to the 16th centuries. The decline of Rome happened from 156 AD to 476 AD, and the Dark Ages ensued drastically from there. What's the Reformation? Well, if you don't have any idea what the Reformation is, I would highly recommend a YouTube video that's available about Martin Luther. By the way, if you're a millennial, I'm not talking about Martin Luther King. There was a Martin Luther <laughs> before uh, Martin Luther King. That's who I'm talking about. He was the reformer. There's a, like an hour and a half uh, movie about him on YouTube that's available, and I'm sure it's available in Christian bookstores. You should get it and listen to it, and then you would understand how uh, a portion of the Reformation, well, it really is the pinnacle. It, it didn't start with Martin Luther. Uh, there, were, there were many others that, uh, that actually uh, came before Martin Luther, but Martin Luther was the one who brought it to a head, and it really um, took off uh, during um, his efforts to hold the Roman Catholic Church. You know, he took them to task for their great hypocrisy and heretical teachings and so forth. And I highly recommend that. Get interested in your Christian history. It will do wonders for your understanding of your uh, heritage and your faith. Martin Luther, you know, he is the one who we call the father of the Reformation. He lived from 1483 to 1547. Here's a quote from him. Unless I am convinced by proofs from Scripture, or by plain and clear reasons and arguments, I can and will not retract, for it is neither safe nor wise to do anything against conscience. Here I stand, I can do no other. God help me. Amen. This was what he said when he was being charged by the Roman Catholic Church for heresy, and he took his own defense and stand and made this statement, which is very, uh, very famous uh, now in retrospect. But uh, please look that uh, video up, that video of his life. It's amazing. Guess what activated the whole Reformation movement? It was a return to a literal method of the interpretation of Scripture. Luther, like most of the reformers, rejected the validity of allegory. He totally denied its claim to be regarded as a spiritual interpretation. He taught that each passage of Scripture has one clear, definite, and true sense of its own. All others are doubtful and uncertain opinions. Farrar, in his book, wrote of St. John Lateran that he had learned from the revival of letters that scripture must be interpreted by laws of grammar and the laws of language. And then John Wycliffe wrote in the 13th century, quote, the whole error in the knowledge of scripture and the source of its debasement and falsification by incompetent persons was the ignorance of grammar and logic. John Calvin, for the first time in a thousand years, gave a complete rejection of the method of Philo. Calvin wrote, quote, Let us know, then, that the true meaning of Scripture is the natural and obvious meaning, end of quote. Quote, A passage may have a literal or a figurative sense, but cannot have two senses at once, end of quote. Brothers and sisters, you see, algorithm was not born out of the study of scriptures, but rather a mean, a tool to merge Greek philosophy with Christianity. Ultimately, the Catholic Church never recovered from this error and is still heavily under this belief system today. The Protestant movement today is moving rapidly in the same direction there is a spirit of error that is setting this world up for a world religion that will be a professed church without the blessing or involvement of the real God. And the only way this can be accomplished is to change the meaning of the Bible. Let the words mean something other than what they say so we can fool the people. In conclusion, 
all interpretation began with the literal interpretation of Ezra. This same literal method became the basic method of rabbinism. It was the accepted method of the New Testament in the interpretation of the Old Testament, accepted both by Jesus and the apostles and John. It was the same method used by the church fathers until the time of Origen, who devised this allegorical method to harmonize Platonic philosophy and scripture. Augustine's influence established the allegorizing method into the established church and brought an end to all true biblical interpretation. The allegorical system continued until the Reformation, and at the Reformation, the literal method was solidly established once again and continues to this day to those of us who continue to fight for it. But we are losing the battle in numbers. That is, there are more people reverting back and you will know them by their prophetic beliefs. If somebody believes that the rapture of the church is going to happen at the end of the tribulation, or they don't believe in the tribulation, or they don't believe in the millennial kingdom, or they take some other strange position with what is clearly taught in scripture, like they'll teach you that there is no rapture of the church taught in the Bible you will know they've come to these conclusions because they use the allegorical method of interpretation. You cannot see a lack of a millennial kingdom of Christ and the restoration of Israel as a people and as a country. You cannot come up with these conclusions that God will not restore Israel, will not come back and have a thousand year kingdom when they are saying those things they mean it because they're using allegory to interpret scripture they've discounted away all the scriptures that say this is indeed going to happen on our side the side of truth the side of clear biblical interpretation in a historical grammatical sense we have not only the obvious scriptures that say that God is going to restore Israel in the last day and he's going to rebuild them and he's going to bring them back and forever ensure their safety, we have only to look at the news every night to see how predominant Israel is in the news, in the world, and how God has just made her a land again flowing with milk and honey one of the greatest lights of brightness in the Middle East that exists. This year declared the eighth most powerful nation in the world. From nothing to the eighth most powerful nation in the world in 70 years. All of that happened during my lifetime except for 10 years. I'm almost 60 and it has been amazing to watch. Brothers and sisters... I beg you to pay attention to the details and understand that it is how you approach scripture to interpret it that matters first before we can get into what those scriptures mean. And as I put forth my series on Bible prophecy, uh, which I have many lessons that I want to put uh, on this podcast, I want to tell you that, most importantly, you've got to know what this means. And if it is ignored, then you will not be able to ascertain the difference when you hear someone start undoing what the Bible teaches. And it's undone by spiritualizing Scripture. The enemies of this doctrine are those who hold to the replacement theology. They hate Israel. They think Israel and, and all that's happening over there has nothing to do with God. He didn't restore them. He didn't put them there. He didn't make it happen. And they're ignoring all the miracles that it took to get that all done. They're ignoring every last thing that has happened with Israel as if uh, Israel just did it for themselves. And if you want to be blind, 
then of course you can be. It's easier to be blind than to be open-eyed and knowing and seeing what's actually happening. I hope you have a deep interest in this as I do and I hope that you'll pay attention when you read the scripture and you, uh, and you pay attention to things like Ezekiel where it talks about the valley of dry bones and you go back and you'll read that and you realize that uh, that was uh, a message given that God promised that he was going to revive the nation of Israel. And while he has not yet revived them spiritually, that's why you can find much to fault with them, and you can find much to hate about what they do in some cases. What they fail to realize is, is that God is getting ready to breathe that new life in them. So that valley of dry bones is gathered together in one place. Yeah, there's still bones, they're still spiritually dead, but he's getting ready to breathe life into them. But he's not going to do that until he takes his church home. Because God only works with the church now. There's only one way of salvation in any dispensation. And when he was working with Israel, he was not building his church. Or he, was not, he had not established his church. When he turned away from Israel, he established his church. When he takes his church home, he is going to turn back to Israel. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came in a new way, I should say, on the day of Pentecost. And that doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit of God wasn't here uh, before that. It wasn't here in that sense for that purpose. And when the rapture takes place, the one who now restrains is going to be taken out. The Holy Spirit that came and established the church is going to leave with the church and bring them to Christ in the air to meet the Lord in the air. And then we're going to fulfill John chapter 14, where we're going to the Father's house, to the place God has prepared for us to be with Him forever, never to be away from Him again. And that is going to happen before God turns back and deals with Israel and the 70th week of Daniel, and the book of Revelation from Revelation chapter 4 to chapter 19. All of these things which are going to be fulfilled are getting set up. And like I said, we are in the last five minutes of the final hour, and Jesus has made it very clear that all these things are going to come to pass together collectively in a very short period of time. And so I appeal to you to get your interest in this because what we really need in our life is not to be concerned about this life, but to be storing up treasure in heaven. I want to get you to fathom what it's going to be like for your life to, to be in existence in the world to come and to be one of the kings and priests that are appointed unto God and to be one of the rulers that are going to actually have a position in the kingdom of God when he rules and reigns for a thousand years on the earth. You are going to be a governor. You are going to be a king and a priest. You are going to be literally these things in the kingdom of God because that is what God has promised to those who love him. You read the book of Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3 and it tells you what is promised. Realize the seven church messages to you, not one of them. You don't find yourself in one of those churches. Your the message is all seven, all seven messages written to all the churches to be heard in all the churches. It's like a seven-layer cake. It's like seven pancakes on a plate. You eat the whole thing, you listen to the whole thing. The promises at the end for those who overcome. These are promises that are going to be literally fulfilled to the church. None of them have to do with dwelling in Jerusalem and being called Israel and replacing the actual Israel and all of these things. None of that is, is true. The book of Romans makes it perfectly clear that God is going to restore Israel and he has not turned away from his people. So I promise you this, that if you get yourself interested in this subject, it is a subject that has great reward because it builds a case for where you're going into your future, which is going to be the place you will find true perfection and happiness that God has promised in what we call heaven. But that heaven is going to be a heavenly kingdom. And for here, it's going to be a thousand years of dwelling on the earth in a new body, in a new creation, 
working and functioning as emissaries for God with indestructible bodies that are eternal. It is going to be a beautiful thing. And it is very, very soon to be seen in the face of the earth. If you don't believe what preachers are saying about this, like myself, just watch the news and watch all the doom and gloom and all the things that say we are messed up and we are going to self-annihilate. The Bible agrees with that. Jesus said, if the, except the days would be shortened, no flesh would be saved. Man will self-annihilate if God leaves man to himself. But he won't and he hasn't and he's not going to. Thank you for listening today. God bless you. I hope that this has been helpful and I pray it will be a blessing to your future efforts to understand Christ. You've been listening to a Fathom Ministries podcast with me, Pastor Nathan Reynolds. You can find more podcasts and contact info at our website at www.fathomministries.org. Thank you for listening. Without an overdose of you